So who were these uh, these early anatomically modern humans? Who were the people who were living at the Landra Lakes and also um, the rest of, of large parts of Asia, of Europe, of Africa? Um, how did they live? Uh, a lot of the evidence we have from uh, this period actually comes from uh, Europe and uh, this is not a, a, a because there were more anatomically modern humans in Europe nor because the ones in Europe were doing anything particularly different than the ones in Australia or Africa or anywhere else. Um, this is one of those, uh, those moments where you have to pay attention to your data and you have to look at the, the biases that are built into your data. A biased data set doesn't necessarily mean you have to discard that data set. All data is biased. All data is laden with the approaches that the investigators have taken to it, whether you're an archaeologist or a physicist. Uh, but you have to be aware of the different factors that go into formulating the data sets that you're examining. Um, one of the, the factors that goes into uh, archaeological data is that you only find data when you go out and look for it, in most cases. People will find things occasionally and, and recognize them as interesting, but um, it, it's mostly that you're, you're going to get data when you actually search it out. And um, for various historical reasons, most of that work uh, has been done in Europe. It's in Europe that you have people with the, the wealth uh, and the interest uh, to actually go out and pursue um, these very early uh, periods in, in human history. So this has nothing at all to do with the development of Europeans as distinct from any other anatomically modern humans. Um, the fact that we have more information about um, Europeans in this period has got to do with where we've been looking for the data. One of the earlier sites connected to um, anatomically modern humans in Europe earlier, both in the sense of, of how old the site is, but also in the sense of earlier uh, in its discovery, is um, a, a site you will probably have heard the name of before, Cro-Magnon, uh, or uh, to pronounce it the way most Americans would, Cro-Magnon. It's a cave near the uh, southern French town of Les Aisies. So the people we're talking about here were um, probably nomadic groups that lived in, in relatively small numbers, uh, groups of about 20 to maybe 50 people, two, three, four family units all living, uh, living together. Um, they probably would have met together in larger groups uh, at different periods of the year, probably you know late summer and fall when there are, are larger amounts of food available in the natural landscape. Um, and they may have traded supplies and news and, and people would have met people to, to, to intermarry um, in, in ways that would have been probably very familiar to, to any of us, as though, even though their lives were, were very distinctive from us. These, of course, were gatherer-hunter peoples, as all humans had been um, from, from this period. Uh, they did not farm, but we'll get to farming in, uh, in the next uh, period. Another interesting point to, to throw in here is that, you know, well, we, we sometimes have referred to and be, uh, these as, you know, cavemen or cave people. Most of them probably did not live in caves most of the time. The reason we get the impression that they do is because a lot of the sites that are associated with this period are, uh, are formed in caves, and that's a simple matter of, of preservation. Um, if you happen to be an a, a, a anatomically modern human 45,000 years ago in, in southern France, um, a cave is going to give you a perfectly good shelter from a rainstorm, and it's a perfectly good place uh, to live for uh, a few weeks or a few months while you hunt the game and gather the wild resources in a particular area. Um, while you're doing that, you're creating trash, and that trash is being tossed over your shoulder. I mean, there's no particular reason to, to carry it far away from your cave when you're only going to leave that cave in a, in a few weeks anyway. And unlike the sites that are formed in the rest of the landscape, um, which might be impacted by later development or by, uh, by later groups coming through, those remains that are thrown around in a cave um, are going to more or less stay there. And the occasional flooding rainstorm is going to come in and get the, the, you know, a bunch of new dirt into the bottom of a cave, cover up everything that's there, and seal it over rather nicely for archaeologists. And, and after archaeologists realized uh, this potential with sites, early sites like uh, Cro-Magnon, they began looking in caves as a place that might give them information about early people. Um, but most of the time, these people did not probably live in caves. They probably built structures uh, that were very ephemeral, very, um, you might call them flimsy, uh, out on the landscape, which simply don't uh, survive.
We last talked about technology with this graphic on the, uh, the upper right-hand corner of the screen and, and talked about um, how the tools created by uh, Neanderthals, the Mousterian uh, tradition, the Mousterian technology, uh, which was also used effectively by anatomically modern humans in this area, uh, and how efficient this was. So the earliest tools would have been uh, the, the Oldowan technology, which would have given you about uh, 8 centimeters of cutting edge from a half a kilogram of flint. Uh, the Homo erectus, uh, from 1.8 million years on, made Acheulean technology, those Acheulean hand axes, and got 30 centimeters of cutting edge from the same amount of flint. Uh, Mousterian technology uh, could produce 90 centimeters of cutting edge. But again, you know, we're, we're picking up the pace in our changes, and those changes are, are becoming uh, exponentially greater. The Upper Paleolithic technology that we're going to be talking about uh, here is uh, the lowest on this this uh, image and um, is able to produce about nine meters of cutting edge um, from that same uh, half kilogram of uh, of high quality flint. Managed to get 90 centimeters of uh, of, of cutting edge. Um, by the time we're talking about the 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 end of the Pleistocene, the period of uh, of the last 30 or 40 thousand years. Um, and uh, uh, anatomically modern humans uh, in, in, say, southern Europe in this case, we've got a new uh, stone tool technology, which we're just going to call Upper Paleolithic Technology. And remember, upper, if you're thinking like an archaeologist, is higher up in the stratigraphy, closer to the surface, meaning more recent. This Upper Paleolithic Technology is, um, uh, like the rest of the things in this section, is really picking up the pace in terms of development. It is um, much more complicated than whatever came before it. There were different kinds of tools in the Mousterian, and they used these, these uh, really impressive um, prepared core techniques, the Lavalois technique, in order to make um, all sorts of different um, tools. But that, that, those patterns um, get more and more complicated um, by orders of magnitude um, again. The book focuses, your tech book focuses a fair bit on a boron, and this is a, a picture of a boron right up here. This is an Aurignacian boron. Um, that dates somewhere between to, into the upper 20,000s of, of, of years ago um, in uh, in southern France. Um, they also have um, the the sort of the the, the crowning glory of, of the blade technology, and you can see some of the blades that we're talking about here. Um, some of these chipstone pieces of technology, um, uh, these are our Ignatian down here in the bottom part of, part of the screen, blades that were five, six, eight centi uh, inches uh, long, long, thin, straight blades. Um, the other uh, thing we have developing here is um, a use of not just stone, but of uh, antler and uh, and bone to make tools. And we have the first composite tools, uh, where we have not just uh, the um, the development of um, a particular tool for a particular purpose, but somebody actually developing pieces of tools and putting them together. So someone might take a, a, a long, straight, flat piece of bone and, uh, and cut a groove in it. And into that groove, instead of just using the bone itself for something, or instead of just using little pieces of flaked stone for something, that ancient toolmaker would actually fit tiny little flakes of stone, very, very small, very, very sharp flakes of stone into the groove and make um, a, a whole new kind of tool you couldn't make out of a single piece of stone, no matter how uh, good you were at, at, at flint napping. And then all sorts of examples of things uh, that are uh, just completely different kinds of technology that we've never had before. Um, this is what's referred to as an atlatl, and uh, it is a tool which is used to increase the, the range and accuracy of thrown spears. Here's a, a little video of a couple of people demonstrating a modern atlatl. Uh, and the, the principle behind it is, is pretty straightforward. It's that if you could make your arm longer, then the end of your arm would be moving faster when it was throwing a spear, just like a, 
a, a bicycle wheel, the, the tire on the outside is moving faster than the spokes in the middle or, or the, the, the fulcrum around which it, um, it rotates. Further out you go away from the point of rotation, in our case the, the shoulder, um, the faster the speed is going to be and the more energy is going to be embodied in, uh, in that spear. And as a result, as you're seeing your throw here, uh, you can throw uh, much farther and, um, and uh, more accurately as well. We want to talk a little bit about the environment that they were living in here. Remember, this is, this is a, a Pleistocene, so we're talking 40, 50, 60,000 years ago. Um, the, the time period that's the end of the Pleistocene, better known as? The Ice Age, right? And this is not just a period where everything was always colder, but it's a period where things are getting warmer, getting colder, getting warmer, getting colder, these glacials and interglacial periods. In fact, one of the suggestions for how the, uh, our ancestors um, developed all these technologies and why they developed all these different technologies and other uh, behaviors that we'll talk about uh, at, at about this time was actually that the changing environment sort of kept them on their, their evolutionary toes. It made them really rely on non-biological adaptations and these exosomatic means of adaptation because you couldn't evolve fast enough for uh, a, a temperature change on the scale and speed that, that we're talking about um, uh, over the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, a few thousand years in the, the Pleistocene period. Um, for a lot of the time that we're talking about, the environment in Europe in particular, again, this is where the evidence is coming from um, because that's where people are looking for it, was a lot rougher than it is today. So it's co not covered by ice, but it's certainly all a lot colder. There's ice covering the top part, sort of Scandinavia, and, um, and uh, up, up sort of to northern Germany and Denmark in a lot of these periods. And uh, that makes this area much more like um, uh, sort of a, a steppe uh, environment. Um, semi-arid, very cold, seasonal, not iced, but uh, not something you're necessarily going to uh, recognize as familiar to what we've got today. Um, one example site of that time is, uh, is this one. It's uh, called Dolna Vestanitsa. It's today in, in the, the Czech Republic. Um, and it, it's an area that's now sort of a breadbasket of Central Europe. I mean, this is a place where you can see, you know, these are beautiful fields of wheat growing here uh, in, uh, in Central Europe right now. But at the, um, uh, the time this site dates to, which is about 25,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago, um, it's sort of the heart of the last really substantial set of glaciation. So the period where, uh, towards the end of the Pleistocene, there was a relatively long chunk of time where things were a lot colder than they were warm for a lot longer, a lot most of that, that period of time. And at that time, this would have been actually above the tree line. So there would have been no trees in this area uh, where people were living. This is uh, on, a, on a ridge line, so you've got good visibility right here. I mean, you can see you know, up to the edges of these hills. You can see for several miles in different directions. You've got a little stream nearby. Um, this is a nice spot to hang out, particularly if you're looking for large herbivores. Large herbivores, kind of like these guys. Um, mammoths, mastodons, animals like that that we no longer see would have been pretty common, pretty large herds of these guys moving across this place. We've got hundreds of mammoths and mammoth remains um, found on these late Pleistocene sites and it's pretty clear and if we're talking about, you know, thinking about that, that evolution of technology we talked about at Classy's River Mouth in southern Africa from 120 to 60,000 years ago, people um, getting better and better at hunting, being able to do more than just scare docile animals off a cliff, but actually tangle with the, the, the Cape Buffalo, the really nasty and, and um, abundant but difficult to hunt animal. Um, by the time we're talking now here, 25,000 years ago, um, uh, anatomically modern humans are capable of taking on the, the real big, uh, biggest of the big game. Um, mammoths and, uh, and, and animals like them. These things are uh, well, mammoth. Um, if you haven't been to a museum where you've seen one, they, they would have had to stoop to stand in this room. Uh, it would have been a pretty easy matter for this, uh, this animal to flick a tusk at one of us and, um, you know, I I'd say we would have a very bad day at the end of that encounter, right? Um, let's put it that way. Um, but they're being used for a lot of different things by the folks at Dolna Vestanitsa. This is a really kind of confusing looking um, uh, map. It's something that uh, if you sort of looked at it in context, you'd be able to understand. We've got different, uh, different things sort of um, coded in different ways. So you've got bones like that. 
and rocks and other things sort of um, all me uh, mixed up together uh, at, uh, at Dolnevestinitsa. A big thing you get out of killing a mammoth is an awful lot of meat. And we're talking you know, about people who are living in relatively small groups. Uh, 20, 30, 40 people is the, the whole of your group. It's based on family units, these, these very small bands, uh, m probably moving around the landscape, spending some time in, in some uh, spots. And so we're looking at a, 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 an area which is sort of more or less temporary campsite, maybe a place to which people come back seasonally uh, for uh, a long period of time. Um, not only are they going to get enough food to feed everyone in the, uh, in the camp for a very long period of time, as long as you can keep the meat uh, edible uh, from one mammoth kill, you're actually going to find people doing some really creative things with, uh, with it. Um, that last slide is a little bit difficult to parse out, but this is actually a reconstruction of what the, uh, the home that we're looking at there probably would have looked like. Um, it would have actually used mammoth bones not for food, uh, although you would have used the meat for food as well, but the bones would have been made use of actually as construction material at this particular site. So long bones here holding up the door, tusks or ribs like that, and lots of these, hundreds and hundreds of collarbones um, all at, uh, at, the same, uh, uh, at the same site. Way more than we're talking about you know, for one animal kill. And these are actually being collected, right? They're actually being um, sought after. Every time they kill uh, another mammoth, they're going to make a real point of making sure you get the collarbones, which you can fit in. Uh, in this sort of uh, puzzle piece fashion here and get a kind of a, a structure out of it, yeah. Yeah, they were going to be bringing these things from reasonably far away. Um, I wouldn't overstress the temporary nature of this. Obviously, this is not like a tent you can pick up and carry on. I just wanted to make the point that this wasn't a permanent settlement where people were spending their whole lives and, and multiple generations in the same place. Um, a lot of, uh, and a lot of hunter-gatherer um, uh, cultures today and ethnographically recorded and probably uh, historically, what you see is a sort of a regular seasonal round where the same group of people would come back to the same places on a regular basis. And this site would have been um, a, a, a good one for that. It's a good place to hunt mammoths. It's a good place to get uh, the, those resources. They wouldn't be carrying these things around, but they were probably bringing them in from quite a long ways. Yeah, good question. Following a request from one of you fine fellows, today's In Focus comes from the Ukraine and the small town of Mezherich. For it was here in 1965, when Mr. Novitsky was expanding his cellar, that he unearthed the lower jawbone of a mammoth. This was quite a surprise, and archaeologists were called in. Subsequent excavations uncovered 149 mammoth bones, a truly mammoth find. The sheer number of bones found on the site led archaeologists to assume that this had been a kill site, a place where mammoth were hunted and dismembered. However, bit by bit, the bones seemed to form discrete piles, and more than this, the piles seemed to have an order to them. Eventually, four of these ordered piles were uncovered, and it was soon realized that they had been structures, a group of houses, if you will, made from mammoth bones. They became known as the Mezherich Mammoth Camp. These impressive structures are found across this part of the world and date to between 15 and 22,000 years ago, during the last ice age and the Upper Paleolithic. By virtue of their construction, they belie a hardy and resourceful group of people, surviving in fairly extreme conditions. Bone needles found on the site also attest to this. Clothing had to be well made, and so therefore did the tools which made clothing. The landscape at this time has been described as a patchwork, ranging from glaciers to tundra forest steppe, a truly challenging combination. These hardy homes were constructed to withstand everything, from snow and blizzards to relatively mild, if windy, conditions. These structures were built to last, and could easily be occupied by tens, if not up to a hundred, individuals. There is much debitage and waste from making of tools in these huts, and the pits dug around them indicate that they acted as beacons, drawing many people together in one place. Some have suggested that within these structures of mammoth bone and animal skin, 
larger family groups would draw together at certain times of the year, pooling their resources in order to outlast the harshest of the weather. In this way, Mezoich would have been a welcome sight to anyone, an oasis of warmth and companionship, though curiously enough they lack a crucial component, portable art. Art made from baked clay, or carvings in antler, bone and ivory, are a signature of human activity at this time. Even simple etchings are often found on tusks and teeth, so why not at Mezoich? This is possibly due to their location, very far north in the Ukraine. It may be that survival was more important than making art. However, one of the mammoth skulls does show signs of artistic endeavour, with carvings and hints of colour, possibly representing fire. Some have also said that the structures themselves are an artistic achievement, a monument. To make each one, it is likely that a whole herd of mammoth was killed. As you can imagine, this was no mean feat. Mammoth, after all, were massive animals, and it's hard to think that they would have been anything but difficult to hunt. We should not underestimate the achievement of these mammoth bone huts, gathering together such heavy materials to create marvellous and sturdy structures, such ingenuity in using the most unlikely of materials to create beautiful buildings is most certainly admired in other parts of the world today. So there you go, as requested, the mammoth bone huts of Mezarich, truly remarkable structures.